this thing to work. There it goes. Um, because I can just announce things. How's that? Um, the psalm, even the, the psalm that's printed on here, you can follow along in the hymnal, so it'll be fine. Will you figure this out? Okay. We've been adjusting back the number of copies. Apparently, we went a little too far. Welcome, everybody. Tonight, our service is going to recognize the feast day from last Sunday, but we didn't celebrate it on Sunday, so we're going to celebrate it tonight, and that's St. Barnabas. St. Barnabas, uh, one of the apostles. And because it's a feast day and we have an organist, I thought it'd be nice to sing a few more hymns than what we usually, usually we just sing one, but we'll sing three tonight. So let's sing a hymn of invocation, Lord of Our Life, hymn 659, 659.
We stand. Our service follows the order of divine service setting one, which is on page 151. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, and have not kept your commandments. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins, as a called and ordained servant of Christ. And by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, throughout all ages. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, your faithful servant Barnabas sought not his own renown, but gave generously of his life and substance for the encouragement of the apostles and their ministry. Grant that we may follow his example in lives given to charity and the proclamation of the gospel. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the observation of the festival of St. Barnabas is from Isaiah chapter 42. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to his people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon and from the prison those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the end of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that fills it, the coastlands and their inhabitants. Let the desert and its cities lift up their voice, the villages that Kedar inhabits. Let the the inhabitants of Selah sing for joy. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise in the coastlands. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you don't have a sheet, uh, the psalm is Psalm 112. You can follow along at the front of the hymnal as well. Psalm 112. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. Yeah. 
The second reading is from Acts chapters 11 and 13. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them was named Agabus and stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined, everyone according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Now there were in the church of Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a member of the court of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. And he charged them to take nothing for their journey, except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Our hymn of the day is by all your saints in warfare, hymn 518, and just a note, What we do with this hymn is stanza one, then you find the stanza for the day, which today is stanza 17, St. Barnabas Apostle, and then we go back and sing stanza three. Make sense? One, 17, and then three.
While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. There's a certain suspicion among Lutherans, at least many of the Lutherans that I know, that celebrating these festival days of the saints of the church is suspect. A certain anxiety enters the conversation, especially when you get to those who are not as significant and there's not as much written in the scriptures about them, like Barnabas. And I think there's many possible reasons for, for that. One is that Lutherans are so delightfully and doggedly Christ-focused that anything threatening that focused on Jesus Well, that's suspect or even alarming. That's one possibility. Another possible reason is that observing the saints' days is something that other churches do, and we don't want to be confused with them. A third possibility that fits with the thoughts of Garrison Keillor is that many Midwestern Lutherans are just too nice and too self-effacing to want to focus on themselves. And the idea of putting all that emphasis on another Christian makes good Midwestern Lutherans uncomfortable. There is, of course, also the possibility that the observance of saints' days may lead to losing the forest for the trees. We don't want our focus on Barnabas or any other saint to reduce our focus on Jesus, our Savior. But there is also a problem by having eliminated the feast days and the saints' days uh, in our calendar and not observing those commemorations well, we lose what you might actually call are the heroes of our faith. It's hardwired into our nature that we look for heroes, not just Jesus, but others who, following in the train of Jesus, having faith in him, then live life, lives of repentance, forgiveness, but also noble and good service. So having eliminated these saints' days, there is a vacuum, and we look for heroes. And so, especially as American Protestantism kind of held the day in the 20th century, then we saw the rise of the comic book industry in creating new heroes to fill the saints who had supplanted, say, the Greek and the Roman gods and those ancient heroes. We need a hero. We need examples for us to emulate and to to model. And can we do that without losing our focus on Jesus? That's the question. And I think at least in part, the suspicion about these days is well-founded. The devil, the world, and our sinful flesh have been working together for thousands of years to take our eyes off Jesus and put our focus elsewhere. But the most common alternative focus is not the heroes of the faith. It's usually on one person in particular. And our eyes are turned inward. We become navel gazers, as Luther said staring at our belly buttons, narcissists. This is even, and perhaps even particularly, a temptation known by pastors and other church workers and those who are dedicated enough to come out on a Wednesday to an extra small divine service. You're a hearty crowd. There's a temptation among us to start to think about the Christian life in the church and the activities of the church as our own, ours to use and manipulate and control tempted to become possessive of these things as if they're yours and they're your creation. Pastors are too. There are moments when you hear, when, when I hear one of the faithful members, with a, maybe one of the more intense ones, say, this is my church and I won't let it change. And that might set your teeth on edge. But I must admit that I'm no different and you might not be either. I have my visions, my dreams, my hopes, my ideas of what this church should be. How often do you think of your faith as something that you can control and use and manipulate rather than a gift to you bought from the Holy Spirit for his use? How often do you think of the vocations that God has given to you as yours, something that you've done rather than something he has given? And then you start to want to exert a little more control on them. Again, this is what the devil, the world, and our flesh has been doing, well, throughout all of human history since the fall. 
sin-broken and self-centered minds are quick to make things about you and yourself. Very quietly and subtly, you fo- want to focus on the things that you do to the church and for the church and your place here, or maybe the way that you have done God-pleasing things in your vocations to others as husband or wife or citizen or worker and the like. And Jesus, the head of the church, might just become then an afterthought. So the problem is the saints or Barnabas, well, it's the same with us. It's our inclination to sin. We all have that same problem. But then Luke's words in the book of Acts that we heard snap us back to reality, God's reality. In Acts 11 that we heard, the work of the church is described as men of Cyprus and Cyrene who came to Antioch and spoke of the death and resurrection of Jesus to the wrong people and not in the way that the apostles had wanted to the Jews. Instead, they spoke to the Hellenists, those Jewish converts, but Greek-speaking. And then Barnabas was sent by the church in Jerusalem to spy out, to witness to the events that are happening there, these crazy events that shouldn't be. This wasn't a task that Barnabas took for himself. It was one that was given to him. He was sent by the church in Jerusalem for the task. And this wasn't Barnabas' work. It was actually the church's work, even if it was a bit misguided. Then you fast forward, as we did, to chapter 13 of Acts, and you find something similar. There the church prayed, and the Holy Spirit said, Set apart Paul and Barnabas for the work to which I have called them. Following that, the church did set aside Paul and Barnabas by laying hands on them after fasting and praying. Barnabas didn't get to decide what he wanted to do for the church. Instead, the Holy Spirit set him aside and Paul for a task and gave him the work to be done. That's how vocations go. God calls you and you go. Not, I think I want to do this, and then God says, that's a good idea. (laughs) The office of the ministry, in particular, as a pastor, well, this is, another, this is a place where it's hardest to learn, that it really isn't about me. You'd think it would be, since I'm elevated, I'm in this pulpit, and you all get to stare at me for hours each week. But it's not about me. And it's not about my congregation, at least not primarily, or my work, or my preaching, or anything. Yes, it comes from my mouth, but it's not mine. It's the Lord's. It's His work. The office of the ministry, preaching the gospel and administering the Lord's sacraments. Well, there it is. It's about the Lord. It's about Christ. It's not my ministry, and this is not the congregation's work. It's Jesus' work. He's the one who brings the congregation together. He's the one that gives the congregation his word and sacraments. He is the one revealed by the Holy Spirit in the preaching of the word as the one who came as Savior and Redeemer for his church. He is the one who proclaims forgiveness of sins in his own name. He's the one that feeds you with his body and blood to strengthen and to encourage you in the faith today and always. This is just as true for you as it is for a pastor. The work that you are given to do in the congregation here, where you're a member, isn't about you either. It's about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Whatever you do in the congregation, it is a work for Jesus, not for yourself. And whatever work that you do in the other vocations that God has given you is, again, not for you, but for Jesus. Out of love for Jesus, you love your neighbor. So, if you're a pastor or a layperson, the work that you do at home or as a volunteer or anywhere else, it's all a work of the Lord's creation given to you. It's not about you but the Lord as you serve him as a lamp and and on a stand and as a salt, as the salt of the earth. So the word of God, of God comes to you today and calls you to repent of your pride and your selfishness. You can actually consider St. Barnabas and even consider him a hero of sorts, one whom God has given a noble and great work that you too may be given. But turn away from the idea or the expression that this is, in my case, my ministry, or this is your service, or you're here because of the work that you want to do. It's all about you. No. 
You aren't called to be the spotlight or to be celebrated any more than Barnabas. Rather, Barnabas is given to us to spotlight Jesus, to give glory to Christ. And so you too are called to give glory to God and to speak of his truth in grace and forgiveness. That's what life in, the, in Christ church is all about. It's about the Lord Jesus and really about Jesus himself giving you his forgiveness by his word and his gifts to you and to all hearers. As it's gift, then it's about grace. So live in that grace. If you've been self-centered or haven't, the Lord Jesus has died for you. The Lord Jesus has put you here in his church. The Lord Jesus has called you to serve him and those around you. The focus is not on you any more than it's on Barnabas, but the head of the church, the resurrection and the life, even our Lord Jesus. In his holy name we pray. Amen. We stand to confess the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of this Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was seen in, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son Together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy, Christian, and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O loving Father, you have kept your promise to Abraham and brought forth the offspring in whom all nations are blessed and counted righteous, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Give to all people saving faith in this promised Savior and work in them the love that flows from your love alone. Lord, in your mercy, Give boldness and diligence to all ministers of your church, that they may proclaim the faith once delivered to the saints. Be with all vacant congregations and pastors considering calls. Send forth laborers into your harvest and sustain those you have sent. Be with those who work this weekend uh, to prepare for the upcoming convention. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord God, since we cannot love you whom we have not seen, while we yet hate our brother whom we have seen, drive all prejudice and hatred from our hearts with your abiding love in Christ, that we may truly show our love for you by loving one another. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, help our hearts to fear you rightly and to hope in your steadfast love. Hold your eye upon us and deliver us from death. Perfect us in your love that we may fear your condemnation, or may not fear your condemnation, but have confidence in Christ for the day of judgment. Lord, in your mercy. O righteous Lord, keep us mindful of the poor who lie suffering at our gates, that we may use our many rich and sumptuous blessings 
from your hand to feed their hunger and ease their burdens in this world. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful God, give repentance and faith to all who come to your altar this day. Grant that we would not come seeking sumptuous earthly food, but instead discern your holy body and precious blood for the forgiveness of sins and receive it in the unity of a true confession. Lord, in your mercy. Finally, Lord God, Heavenly Father, we implore you to rule and govern our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that we may not, like the rich man, hear your word in vain and become so devoted to things temporal that we forget the things eternal. Grant that we may serve those who are in need readily and according to our ability, not defiling ourselves with carousing and pride. In trial and misfortune, keep us from despair, and let us trust your fatherly help and grace, that in faith and Christian patience we may overcome all things. This we ask through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We greet one another with the peace of Christ. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call on the name of the Lord. I will take the cup of salvation and will call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people in the courts of the Lord's house. In the midst of you, O Jerusalem. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, for you have mightily governed and protected your holy church, in which the blessed apostles and evangelists proclaimed your divine and saving gospel. Therefore, with patriarchs and prophets, apostles and evangelists, with your servant, St. Barnabas, 
and with all the company of heaven. We laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, 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 not in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Thank you. 
shed for you. Blood of Christ 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 shed for you. Body of blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you, body and soul, life everlasting. Depart from this peace. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that you, would, of your mercy, would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you, and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. I guess we have a closing hymn tonight. Yeah, we do. Let's sing that. 828, we are called to stand together. Old habits. We don't usually have a closing hymn on Wednesday. All right. That wasn't, that wasn't going to work for us, yeah. 828. All right, thank you. <laughs>